Hello, everyone. And the topic of this lecture is magnetization imaging. Uh, before we will go to magnetization imaging, I would like to say two words. Uh, I would like to come back to domains because uh, one of the main objects which is measured in magnetism, in thin film especially, is domain. So when you have uh, we discussed already the main idea, so it comes from this internal field model of Weiss. And if you have a piece of magnetic material, which is magnetized in one direction, then you will get this imaginary magnetic poles here, and it will create a large dipolar field around. And then if you integrate rate over the volume around the sample, you will get quite large potential energy of dipolar stray field. And of course, uh, physical system tries to minimize the energy, therefore what happens, it splits into domain and then magnetic field created by this domain is compensated partially by domain field. By magnetic field compensated by this part, and then we will have uh, such domain orientation. So the usual way, for example, such domain structures can take place or such one, and here, then at some point, for dipolar, uh, from the point of view of dipolar energy, you want to split the structure in as many domains as possible. But then you will get troubles with exchange interaction because if it's ferromagnet exchange interaction, which is short range but much more powerful, because it means that it doesn't feel there is no exchange interaction between this point and this one. But at the interface, exchange interaction wants to keep spins parallel. And when they are unparalleled, it increases energy drastically. Therefore, system kind of search for a place where mm, uh, the total energy is minimized and make some sometimes very complex domain pattern. And this we already discussed a bit. So what's new here is that minimum of energy we need to take into account exchange magnetostatic, so dipolar field. Uh, and in addition, there is crystallographic anisotropy, which I mentioned two times during the lecture course. So this also should be taken into account. The total energy should be minimized. And uh, what often is studied nowadays is domain wall. So wall, it's a region between two domains. Because as I said, it's exchange interaction, for example, tries to make this domain wall as bright as possible, that angle between neighboring spins is as parallel as possible. Dipolar and anisotropy. And energy wants vice versa to make it a small. Therefore, just two more words about the domain wall, just classification. So there are two main types of domain walls. There are many more. There, are, so there is hybrid between them. There are asymmetric domain walls and so on. But classical uh, domain wall is Bloch and Nil. So Bloch wall is uh, the easiest way to understand it if you imagine that you're working with, not with thin films, but with such a uh, rectangular bulk. And then what you have is uh, the rotation of so magnetization in one side of it. It's pointing up and not here, it's uh, pointing down. So it's 180 degree domain walls, because there are 90 degrees also domain walls, but we just now discussing this main type. And then the question how magnetization changes from this uh, direction to this one. Since it's typical for bulk materials or for thick films, then uh, shape anisotropy, shape anisotropy we discussed, if you have thin films, it always wants to keep your spin in plane. But since now we don't have, uh, uh, we don't have thin films, we have just such a bulk, then magnetization goes like this, it simply changes. So. Uh, it uh, rotates in the plane of the main wall. Or you can say that momentum rotates gradually about the axis perpendicular to the main domain wall. So you, you have this axis which is perpendicular to the main wall and that's how spin is rotated. Shown here in this nice colorful picture. So this is block domain wall. And another one is a nil domain wall. So nil domain wall is typical for thin films where uh, form anisotropy wants to keep your spin in plane. So uh, it's unhappy when spin like here is staying perpendicular to your field. This costs a lot of energy. Therefore, there is another way when spin is always, magnetic moment is always in plane and then it rotates from one to anti-parallel state, simply turning like that. 
and yeah, this one is named nil domain wall. Of course, they react differently on film thickness. Uh, and for example, here there are uh, two graphs. It's wall energy, which should be as minimal as possible, and wall width, the size of the wall, as a function of film thickness. And you can see that for block wall, the thicker the sample is, the less important the shape anisotropy, the smaller the energy. So it means that block wall would prefer to have would have a small energy for six samples. If you will look to nil wall, then vice versa. Minimum of energy you will have for the very thin samples. So the thinner the sample, the better for nil wall. And if to speak about the wall width, nil wall would like for the small energies. Yeah, so it wants to have small energies. It means that it wants to have a wide domain walls. It means that this distance, that angle between, if you take these two neighboring spins, that the angle is practically, that they are practically parallel. And in order to have this, that they are parallel and only on a longer scale, it changes angle. Only in this case, you minimize exchange energy which simply wants to have the parallel, it increases as soon as you have angle. Therefore, it's clear that angle here, that the width of this domain wall should be as large as possible. Now, uh, at this point, and if you speak about block wall, it wants to have six sample, and for six sample, again, the same, we are coming to the same conclusion that, again, wall wants to be as uh, wide as possible, and again, the same reason, just to minimize exchange energy. The angle between these two neighboring spins also is as uh, zero as possible, as close to zero as possible. So and now we are coming to the next question, how to image magnetic fields. So we know even from this first lecture uh, with um, history of magnetism that people have realized at some point that there are magnetic fields lines, but we don't see them. We just, if you, you take two magnets in hand, then you feel that there is something in between. And we don't see it. And Chris sent me a paper about birds. And if I understood correct, uh, in, there is a special magnetic protein in eyes of birds. And scientists believe now that uh, they really see the magnetic field lines and that helps them to fly in a proper direction. Uh, but human being definitely, at least I definitely don't have this. and. Uh, um, the question how to image it. And the easiest what you can do, we've seen it already with such experiment when we, we discussed that the dipolar interaction, is you take uh, iron, you take iron powder, which is uh, magnetic, and then if you will put a magnetic field, for example, simply put this magnet inside, and then each of these magnetic particles, small particles, will rotate along the field. And in such a way, you can um, image magnetic field lines. And this is the very first, uh, the most straightforward way to do it. And it immediately explains how you can manage it if you want to do it at home. But it also went into real technology. So it's named bitter pattern. It's an old, an old method which is uh, almost dead nowadays, so not practically not used. It's uh, replaced by more advanced optical methods, which we'll discuss. But principally, if you have such colloidal magnetic particles, nanoparticles, not such large, these are micron or uh, submillimeter, but you can go to nanoscale and then principally you can get pretty good um, a picture of magnetic field or magnetization if you want to see uh, domains, for example. Now, so from that, what is used nowadays, here's the table in Krishna. So here's beta pattern, and here are many technologies. Some of them, they will not go through everything, but some of them we will discuss today. In this table, I show you just to uh, get an understanding what we actually measure. So you see different methods, they can measure different things. Some of them measure their uh, diversions of a field of induction, magnetic inductance. Uh, some measure B inductance, some measure fluxes, some measure magnetization really. 
So there are different synthesis techniques I'm measuring. Then what else is important? Important is resolution, of course. And there are two values here, typical and limit. And you see all this resolution is in nanometer scale, nano and micron, yeah, this one is micron. So you see that principally such technique as uh, TM, uh, it has down to two nanometer resolutions. So it's practically atomic, so it's atomic scale. It's really uh, amazing how advanced uh, uh, modern technology is. Uh, then it's a question how deep, so if it's in film, most of the technique um, measuring magnetization state at the surface, some are going through. For example, if you, uh, you will use neutrons, they have it, they can slide through, then you can principally measure even very thick samples. But most of the techniques measure just really surface. Therefore, also keep in mind that we measure, can measure different things. Uh, so maximal thickness, thickness is a problem for your sample from many techniques. Uh, it should be smooth, it should be clean. Also, it, some techniques are more sensitive, some techniques are less sensitive. We'll talk about it briefly. And first, what I would like to speak about is uh, magnetic force microscopy. And this is nothing else as a, a adapted atomic force microscope. And I have found the, a set of these movies. As I like them because they are short, a bit more than one minute per technique. Explains main idea. Uh, it's done in uh, France, uh, I think Paris Zoo and uh, CNRS. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's good. So it's technique to probe the surface. And for this, you use this such a tip. And important is, of course, to get the position of tip. And here, people use optical approach. For example, laser, you just shine it, and then it's reflected. And you, with very high accuracy, you can get the position of your tip. And in such a way, you can uh, measure roughness on uh, atomic scale. Another way nowadays is used that you use uh, micro, uh, so you do not work with tip in a DC regime, but instead you apply a microwave signal and it uh, oscillates. Uh, why it's done is this technique is even more uh, sensitive, and the reason is very simple because uh, one of the proper physical properties which human being learn to measure very precisely is uh, frequency. Frequency you can always measure very, very accurately. And uh, when you have this tip, it's uh, interplay, so uh, its resonance frequency depends on the force. So if you, this, uh, you put your magnetic tip into magnetic field, for example, yeah, or close to material, we have on the wildfires, uh, then you will uh, get some additional uh, force applied to the tip and resonance frequency will be changed and uh, resonance frequency you can easily measure and as a result you can define the position of your tip even more precisely yeah you can easily damage tip they are of course done in a way that they are surviving but it's not the, the most comfortable technique to use, at least from our experience in, in Germany. It was, you need to be sure that your tip is good and uh, you need to know how to use it. Although it's one of the main techniques which is used now everywhere, it's one of the key basic techniques. So this is atomic force microscope. So you don't have here uh, magnetic material. So it's not uh, planned for measuring of magnetic materials. But what you can do, you can just put here, sorry, you just can put here a magnetic nanoparticle on top of your tip. And there are many commercially available tips uh, with nanoparticles, magnetic particles. And then when you will scan it along your, for example, domain pattern with tray field, this tray field will be creating force onto your tip. And you can ma easily measure magnetic patterns. 
so it's measured you need to scan with your tip very close to surface 10 20 nanometer mm. and uh, in order to so the point is that the problem is that you principally mfm combines both signals from rfm from atomic force microscope and magnetic response and uh, if you want to separate them what people usually do you make for example two scans one close to surface which has strong contribution from both magnetic and atomic forces and then you make another scan at a larger distance 100 nanometer away and uh, here of course atomic forces you do not feel anymore the short distance but stray field 100 nanometer is not a problem and then comparing this to signals you can subtract magnetic information and here are the examples which you can uh, get uh, with um, MFM. So here's uh, shown the tip, how it really looks. You see, this is 100 nanometer scale, so this tip is 20 nanometer, maybe. So really very small. It has on its own some domain, some magnetic configuration, for example, like that. It can scan domain patterns as we have seen. Yeah, so especially domain walls are usually visible because here that's a place where magnetic, strain magnetic fields are uh, generated. And then, uh, for example, here two words about the research of, uh, phenomena as magnetic vortices. So if you will take a disk, usually it's micron scale, yeah, like shown here, one micron, then magnetization would like to lie along, uh, in plane, if it's in film, and along the edge, yeah, to minimize uh, shape anisotropy. And then it goes like that, and but here it's coming to the point of middle where magnetization, yeah, it's not clear how to stay because from one side it should be uh, pointing down and here it should be pointing down, up. And then what happens is this magnetization simply goes out of plane. And this is named magnetic vortex, very interesting object, many people study it. And here's a picture how magnetic vortex looks like with MFM. And you see that here's 140 nanometers. It gives you immediate understanding that you have resolution, at least on scale of tens of nanometers. So um, magnetic image in MFM. So um, a lot of information. I probably will not be uh, using it. So if it's of interest, uh, you and other students can simply read it. And here it's already staying in this green rectangle. And in order to cover more information over the lecture, I just move on. And the main advantages and limitations I already said. So clear that you need uh, good roughness. Otherwise, if your structure just up and down, you have grains or something, homogeneity tens of micro nanometers, which can be if you have a bad sample, then of course it's very hard to measure and to get some magnetic response. It should be clean and so on and so on. And now we are switching gear and we are coming to completely different uh, technique, a set of uh, uh, several techniques which are based on the interaction of electron beam with a solid. So if you have a solid body, you can focus your electron beam with different energies. So for different purposes and different techniques we are discussing energies from 100 to 1000 kilovolt and then uh, how to describe this beam here you have advantage that you're really on the edge between this uh, wave du uh, particle dualism therefore you can use in some cases it's better to uh, describe your electrons as uh, particles just keep in mind that you are your velocities of particles for example for a thousand kilovolt it's already coming to the speed of light so speed of light is 3 10 to the power of 8 and here is 282 10 to the power of uh, 8 and uh, it's such a very very fast electron but at the same time you can already discuss uh, describe it in the terms of uh, a wave and the wavelength of this wave will be very little it's in pico range, a picometer range, yeah, 1.2 nanometer. And in all this optical technique, we will see the wavelength is usually the limiting factor for resolution and so on. And uh, if light has uh, 500 nanometer wavelength, 
Yes, so here as opposite, you have one picometer. So therefore you understand that resolution of electron-based techniques is much, much higher than optical techniques. Good, so what happens if you focus your electron beam on a solid body? There are many different effects. First of all, something will go through, but your sample should be seen, for example, 100 nanometers. Then some electron can be transmitted. Some will be diffracted. Uh, some will be reflected, backscattered. So these are electrons which are scattered from nucleus. So really like mechanically scattered. And there will be re-emitted electrons. So your beam of electrons can change something and that new electrons will be emitted. Uh, there will be Auger electrons. There will be heat. There might be X-ray emission. Mm. Yeah, you can get a luminescence. So there can be also light. And principally, there, is, there are many different techniques which use different of this uh, physical processes to get some information about material. Of course, these are standard characterization pro, um, uh, techniques which have nothing to do with uh, magnetism and which you discussed in the nanotechnology course last semester. And here, of course, we will focus on that how to get um, magnetic information about magnetization using this technique. Yeah, so here are uh, uh, just a brief sketch to explain what the secondary electron is. Yeah, so the primarily electron drops on your atom, it can free one or secondary electrons from one of the orbits of your atom. And backscattered electrons, for example, it can behave like this, that it's coming close to nucleus, nucleus positively charged, electrons negatively charged, and just scattered in the opposite direction. And, uh, yeah, and now, in order to get magnetic uh, response from the system, we need to at least two uh, physical phenomena should be taken into account. For example, when we discussed this uh, backscattered electrons, uh, imagine that this is magnetic material, it means that there is magnetization, there is associated magnetic field around. And it means that your backscattered electron is flying within magnetic field. Then, of course, you have to take into account Lorentz force, which will change the trajectory of the uh, your electron. And if you have magnetic domain magnetization point in one direction, then electron will fly in one direction. And if it's an opposite, then it will fly in opposite. And then analyze, analyze and simply trajectory or angle under which a secondary electron uh, backscattered electron is detected you can get information about the magnetization and another phenomena we need to take into account is simply spin polarization so these electrons can have a different spin polarization which depends on the uh, uh, magnetization of your system yeah. and uh, if you are able to learn what is the spin polarization of your secondary electrons then you can also get information about uh, your magnetic properties and now we are coming to Transmission electron microscopy. I'm again trying to make it not very loud. Again, just a short movie to refresh memories what this no, uh, normal TEM is. So it uses beam of electron in, instead of light. You can have this focal lenses. Then you put your sample. Then you put, for example, luminescence, fluorescence screen, and you can have the diffraction pattern from your structure. And you can do it since uh, the speeds of the energy of the electrons are so high, you can make, you can reach uh, atomic resolution. Uh, so you can make the whole picture of your sample, of course, in the refract direction. Or you can do it in a scanning way when you focus beam and then you just uh, scan, kind of 
move raster all your surface and then you can get future. Yeah, so you can get even more information if you create such a prism uh, where angle under which uh, the electron beam is deflected depends on and on the energy of this beam. And then you can get extra information from the sample. But usually it's name it's done for chemistry because uh, beams or electron beams of different energy interact differently with different uh, magnetic uh, different materials, chemical elements, and then you can have it chemically sensitive, element sensitive. Good, so as was discussed, here is Lorentz force. So it creates perpendicular to both field and original direction of your magnetic field. Uh, here you need to take into account only one component, which is uh, principally perpendicular to the most pronounced component is of course, that one which flies perpendicular to field B. So electron flying perpendicular to field. And um, that's how it looks in practice. So here you have two domains. One is pointing in one direction. So you see it's perpendicular to the plane of the picture one direction opposite direction here's the main wall as we discussed doesn't matter which one at the moment and then when electron is flying here because of Lorentz force they will change their trajectory to this direction of course they are interacting only when they are flying inside of the sample through the sample or nearby when stray field is still takes place afterwards their trajectory is again line but the trajectory here it will they will uh, change direction one direction and here in opposite and it means the question is what do you see now on the uh, on your screen and here there are two different ways how uh, you analyze the transmitted uh, electron beam first one is so called frenzy mode it's when you just put a screen like this and simply measures what what you have and then you will get such a situation that when you have the main wall in this configuration, the electrons will fly away. And as a result, intensity of your screen, there will be uh, small intensity. So you will get kind of uh, light yeah, or vice versa, dark, depending on the, if it's positive or negative, uh, you will get such intensity profiles. So, and then you can say, okay, here I have my domain wall. In the opposite case, when you have uh, two domain walls uh, uh, differently, when this is, there will be a cross, you will get vice versa, maximum in intensity, but of course you need to take into account interference. Therefore you will get such interference pattern like you can see here at the edges. So you do not have uh, ideal information about, um, about the, uh, Magnetization, but principally still you see already magnetic pattern. The only issue is that this signal here and here principally is the same. Yeah, therefore you need to somehow get understanding where magnetization is pointing in which direction. But at least you can always get information about uh, the domain wall where it is positioned. And as we discussed, this is very uh, the resolution of this technique is very huge. I think in table it was down to two nanometers, and uh, Another approach is Foucault mode. Here you analyze your beam differently. Instead of just putting a, object, a screen here, you put objective lens and then you focus all your electrons. Uh, moreover, you put objective aper aperture that only 
uh, electrons which are focused on this plane. So you can shift it up and down in this plane and in this position, you will be able to, uh, to see the signal. All other beams will be simply ignored. Everything which is not uh, uh, focused or focused in, a, in another plane will not be recorded. And in a such a way, simply change in focus and distance and perform a scanning, you can get very nice pattern of domain walls. So here you can see, and now you already have contrast. This one is dark, this one is white, these two are gray and magnetization points like this direction. Yeah. Uh, so you can get much more information and uh, nice another approach. So this was uh, the analysis of electrons which go through the sample. But you have secondary electrons which are re-emitted and now we will watch another movie, careful. Now we are just memorizing what the scanning electron microscopy is. Again, we use electron beam, not light. We accelerate it and focus on our sample. And see where it is. So in some cases you see what's changing here is intensity, so how many secondary electrons. So depending on the surface, on the, so on, you can get more or less secondary electrons emitted from your sample. And as a result, you can get a profile of the sample. And this is, so if you see at the conference, somebody is showing you a picture with 100 nanometer large structure in 3D. With very high probability scanning electron and a microscopic picture. So. so in addition, we can use X ray and uh, analyze, analyze X ray uh, emitted, get additional information. Okay, so this is scanning electron microscope, and now our question is how to uh, bring uh, information because usually it's not uh, sensitive to magnetization. And now we want to know what we should do in order to be able to measure magnetization using SAM. Magnetic contrast is SAM arises in two ways one that depends on variation of omega and omega is our collection efficiency of the detector which depends on the relative position theta uh, of your detector with respect to the point of emission of the sample and the size of collection aperture so principally omega is something which characterizes uh, the detector how large it is and where it's positioned and second one it's uh, the uh, we can analyze the variation on and B is S and P S it's a backscattered electron. So this is a number of backscattered electron. And this also something which gives us information about the uh, magnetic properties of the simple. So in the first case, type one, again, stray field plays a role uh, because when our electrons are flying away from the sample, uh, they again feel a Lorentz force. That's why the uh, angle position of your uh, sample and its angle dependent sense uh, detection matters. And also number of electrons which reach your detector. So playing with the size of the detector, you can reach more and less. And all this gives you uh, electron uh, information. And in type two, what matters is local variations in the induction B of the sample efficiency results in a change in theta and thus a change of the backscattered emission. It means that here is important 
uh, not the straight field, stray field outside of the sample, but uh, this uh, effective field, so magnetic induction, which takes into account applied field age and magnetization. So this one is sensitive to magnetization, so that's what's going on with your electron within the sample. So this is type two. And then, yeah, uh, analyzing, simply taking, uh, collecting all this information, you can get principally already uh, magnetic patterns. So here you can see the domain, that's how it looks like. One millimeter, so it's large scale. Yeah, because resolution of this technique is not so good, since you are kind of have to collect a lot of information and then analyze, but it doesn't give you really highly resolved picture. And if you want to increase resolution, what you do, you are working with so-called SEMPA, and it's secondary electron microscopy with polarization analysis. So it means that instead of analyzing the position and direction of how electrons are reflected or emitted, you, what you do, you are trying to get information about spin polarization of the secondary electrons. As you can see in this picture, if you focus your incident electron beam, then depending from which domain polarization in one direction or another, your re emitted electrons will have some spin polarization. What you need to do, you need to uh, modify your SEM. So good point about sample is that it's just my uh, upgraded SEM, uh, but you need now a spin det sensitive detector. Uh, which is staying here and what people are usually do they use so-called mod detector so it's a uh, when you take a thin uh, film of gold uh, with large spin orbit interaction electron when it flies through we will discuss similar effect uh, like spin hole effect soon in spintronics part but the point is that when electrons fly through such gold plate uh, it deviates, so depending on the spin orientation. So spin up, electrons will fly more in one direction, and spin down, electrons will fly more in another direction. That's how you can split flow of electrons into two um, parts, with spin up and spin down. And then this gives you information at the end of a day about magnetic uh, configuration of your sample. And here you see the sample pictures. And you see that really you can have very complex domain structures and you see them very well. Scale is 20 micron. Uh, yeah, here it's already four micron, but principally with this you can go to a nanometer range. So, so much about using electron beam for mapping magnetization. And now I would like to switch to the completely different approach in which we use light to do the same job. And if you speak about uh, using of magneto-optical effects, first of all, we have to refer to two people usually refer to two main effects. The first one is Faraday effect, and the second one is magneto-optical Kerr effect. So what is Faraday effect? Imagine that you have transparent or practically transparent uh, magnetic sample. Uh, and ideally thicker if possible. And then you send linearly polarized light through it. So for example, laser gives you always linearly polarized light. So you just send it, it, it has some polarization plane. And when it propagates through magnetic material due to Faraday effect, this angle of polarization, a polarization plate rotates. And then if you know how thick was your sample and uh, you analyze the polarization of the light, which is already out of your sample, you principally can say everything you need about magnetization of your magnetic transparent sample. And uh, this very well established technique, you can buy commercially uh, Faraday filters and so on. Uh, nevertheless, in modern science, we more often work with metallic uh, or non-transparent non samples. And then we cannot send light through, but instead we can reflect light. And in this case, we speak about magneto-optical car effect or MOOC, and uh, yeah, they somehow related. 
but they classify it completely uh, different, but they classify differently. And if to speak about MOOC, I immediately would like to introduce you the three different types of uh, MOOC technique. Uh, so if you, so you can see here the figure, if your sample is magnetized out of plane, that M is pointing like it is shown here, then uh, your incident light and reflected light will lie in the same plane as uh, M magnetization. And when it's a the case, then we are speaking about polar mode. Afterwards, what you can do, you can magnetize the sample in plane, but it's lying like that or like that. And then you have two options. So if your magnetization Line in the same plane as incident and reflected light. So in this plane, then we are talking about longitudinal MOOC. If M is uh, oriented perpendicular to the plane, then it's transfer smoke. So this is a um, classification, and as you understand, I said that these effects are related one to another, and the main idea is very simple. You have magnetic material with some complex uh, magnetic pattern. For example, you shine your light onto the sample and the reflected light will change its polarization and also there will be electricity of, precession, of uh, polarization, elliptical polarization. And you just have to analyze reflected light in order to get understanding what is magnetic properties of your materials. Uh, so when we describe MOOC, usually we are using, we do this in terms of so-called complex dielectric tensor of material. So that's how it looks. So this is the electric constant, epsilon, but um, usually, so, you know, square root of epsilon, it's our refractive index n, uh, in the simplest case. But uh, you not always can use epsilon as just a scalar variable, like, we get used to it in past. So in most, uh, taking it more in depth, it should be a matrix or tensor with such components. And here you see this interesting void vector. So what is this vector? Its direction is parallel to the magnetization. So it's pointing in the same direction as magnetization, but its lens is a material cost constant that describes the magneto-optical rotation of the plane of polarization of the light. So this is, it just shows you the, the strength of this vector, shows you how large is your magneto-optical rotation. Um, yeah, so then of course, linearly polarized light, as you know, you can always represent in terms of uh, two circularly polarized lights, light with positive and negative polarization. And that's how this epsilon plus epsilon minus can be defined through this worked vector. So two, the two pol uh, circular polarized modes propagate differently in the magnetic material and on the margin from it, uh, either after reflection or transmission, they combine again and to give electric elliptically polarized light and rotating the main axis of polarization. So these are two effects which we expect when we shine light on the surface. And again, as we discussed, the very basic physics behind magneto-optical effects is again spin-orbit interaction, like it was magneto-crystalline or mesotropy. Or this will be the main mechanism behind the spintronics effects, which we'll discuss in the next lecture. Okay. So. Here I show you the example. Um, what we need to understand again, if to speak about the ground uh, be physics behind, we again come to the Lorentz force. So this is a mechanism which influences that. Um, how does it work? So if you consider polar mode with magnetization M normal to the surface, then we shine linearly polarized light, and this light will cause electrons in the solid to oscillate in the plane of electric fields, this blue plane here. They will start oscillate here. And uh, 
the reflection of the light from the non-magnetic surface. So now we consider just normal. There's no uh, magnetic material. There's no Lorentz force. Uh, the reflection of the light will not change its polarization, and the amplitude R normal material of the emitting light will have amplitude reflection coefficient parallel and perpendicular to the plane of incidence. So there will be just reflection like it is so that you will get such a, the same light with the same polarization. However, for the reflection from a magnetic surface, the Lorentz force will induce an additional but small oscillatory component V Lorentz which is perpendicular to both E and magnetization M. So it means that if you reflect your polarized light from the magnetic material, the oscillations in which you induce in the uh, material will create a component which is perpendicular to E. It means that you will get re-emission of this component. Uh, you see here with red, it's electric field also, but just a second one secondary one, and as this VL is perpendicular to M and to originally polarization of an electric field. And this brings you to conclusion that MO response consists of two parts, magneto-optical response. First of all, change in the polarization of the in-phase component of reflected light, which gives to the car rotation. So it means that, as you can see in this ellipse, it's already not vertical this polarization plane so it was vertical incident and as the out uh, reflected it already has some angle and in addition a change in the polarization of the out of phase component of the reflected light which gives rise to car ellipticity so in addition to the change of polarization angle you switch from linearly polarized light you switch to elliptically polarized light and then you just have to analyze it and you have all the information about magnetic material. Okay, and here is just briefly the sketch, how it looks in a lab. This is our magnetic sample with domains which you want to investigate. Usually you put your sample inside of a magnet, electromagnet, that you can manipulate structure, you can saturate it, for example, vice versa. Then you need light you send light for example through some, through some lens it's reflected and then you just send it to detector where you measure angle of polarization and ellipticity and uh, mock images are generated using a standard optical microscope it will be used or by raster and an optical spot uh, so it means that you can focus on your sample and just point by point scan everything and here we can read about advantages and limitations of uh, uh, MOOC technique. But what I could simply say is that uh, it's very sensitive technique, uh, relatively easy to use, very popular nowadays. Uh, sensitive because, for example, people also use it to measure spin waves. And spin waves, you do not flip magnetization like in the main way. You just have an angle of precession around one degree. So this is very small change in magnetization and MOOC detected perfectly. You can have it time result, which is also good for the same spin waves down to nanoseconds. And if to speak about limitations, then I would say that uh, the main limitation is given by light, by the wavelengths of light. It means that the size of the structure which you can measure here cannot be smaller than half wavelengths of light which you're using and it means that it's defines you know, 300 nanometers resolution and of course it's not comparable to uh, electron based technique and uh, in this lecture we will not discuss more uh, techniques but you can read them in the book of krishnan or there are many other good. Uh, there is a lot of. Uh, there are many other good books. Um, in particular, there are uh, methods to measure magnetic response using uh, neutron scattering, and uh, very popular nowadays is X-ray technique. And of course, X-ray technique, electron beam-based techniques, they have much higher resolutions than optics. What also we do not discuss in this course is. Uh, 
response on dynamic components. So for for example, for spin waves, as we briefly said that there is possibility to use smoke for is time resolution to measure spin waves, but there is another technique like brilliant light scattering spectroscopy, which is different with respect to this one. It's also of high interest when you just shine photons on your magnetic material and if there are magnons or so some dynamic components the reflected light keeps um, uh, all information about magnons so it's inelastically scattered light and then by analyzing this uh, photons with shifted frequency you can get all information about dynamic response of your material so the message is that there is there are many more techniques which are really interesting but this should be a separate course of lecture. Good, and we are ready then for the last section of this lecture about magnetic materials in use.